Kennedy Forum Junior, John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Colette Tesoro. I'm a first year studying religion and government at the college, and I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are no located on both the Parkside Street and the JFK Street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Please take your seats and join me in welcoming the former chair of the Conservative Coalition, Bridget Toomey. Hello and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. My name is Bridget Toomey and I'm a senior at the college studying government and modern Middle Eastern studies. I'm the former chair of the Conservative Coalition here at the IOP. Tonight, we welcome Senator Pat Toomey and Professor Karen Dynan to the forum for a moderated discussion on the US economic outlook, what's next for the Fed, and the fiscal reg regulatory framework. Senator Toomey joined the US Senate in 2011, representing Pennsylvania, having previously served six years in the House of Representatives. Senator Toomey focused on a platform of economic and job growth, restoring fiscal responsibility, and creating stronger, safer communities. Sought out by his colleagues for his views on financial reform and budgetary issues, Senator Toomey was labeled by the Philadelphia Inquirer as a leading voice on money matters. As ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee and a member of the Budget and Finance Committees, he led successful efforts to cut taxes for families, make the business tax code more competitive, address wasteful government spending, protect, protect children from abusers, and propose a regulatory framework for crypto to, to promote innovation. In addition to his career in public service, Senator Toomey has worked in the financial services industry, served as president of the Club for Growth, and owned and operated a small restaurant chain in the Lehigh Valley with his brothers. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Karen Dynan, professor of the practice in the Department of Economics at Harvard University. Professor Dynan served as assistant secretary for economic policy and chief economist at the US Department of the Treasury from 2014 to 2017 leading analysis of economic conditions and development of policies to address the nation's economic challenges. Professor Dynan's research here at Harvard focuses on fiscal and other types of macroeconomic policy, consumer behavior, and household finances. Please welcome Senator Toomey and Professor Dynan to the forum. So, welcome. Thank you. Welcome back. Yeah, good to be back. Yeah, were you um, involved with the IOP when you were an undergraduate? I was not. You were not. It, it was too far to walk. I was at Elliott House. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you, I, so I, I have a position up at the economics department in addition to being here, but were you one of our concentrators? No, I was a government concentrator. That's pretty good, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I took uh, several economics classes, but uh, uh, I did. I, oh, yeah, certainly. They um, trained you well. Well, um, <laughs> uh, some people would dispute that, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the government was my uh, main focus here. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for coming. Uh, this is just uh, such an honor to have you here. Um, you know, you spent. Uh, so much time in Washington working on such important issues for the country, and it's just uh, kind of amazing to have you here to talk about these things. Um, the way this is going to work is you and I are going to have a conversation for a while, mm -hmm. um, and then um, after we're done with our conversation, we're going to open things up to, um, to the audience to ask questions. So uh, that's going to be the setup for tonight. Um, you know, the, the, the posters advertise that you're coming here to talk about the state of the U.S. economy. So um, that would be great if we could start with the U.S. economy. It seems like um, there are a lot of different views about where we're heading. Uh, some people are talking about the economy going into recession or maybe the economy is in recession. Uh, some people are talking about how maybe we're gonna experience stagflation, so not only a recession, but also high, still high inflation. Uh, but there are other people who aren't so worried. They think, you know, we're heading probably towards a soft landing where uh, inflation comes down and things aren't so bad. So I was just wondering, you know, to start us off, where, where do you see things? Where do you think 
We're heading. So I, I can't help but note the irony that the professor is actually a trained doctorate in economics. I just play one on TV. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'd, I'd be curious about your thoughts on this. So, so my view is it, it's pretty amazing. This is the most predicted and delayed recession in my lifetime, I'm pretty sure. It was supposed to happen sometime last year. It still seems not to have happened. And what's amazing to me is the strength of the consumer. Consumer balance sheets are still in good shape, uh, low leverage. Consumers haven't fully burned through the excess money that we pumped into the system during the COVID shutdown and afterwards. Um, I think that's a big part of what's keeping the economy afloat. But, but this enormous demand for labor is also really amazing, how strong the labor market is. So given that dynamic, um, given that we can talk about the banking system generally, uh, it's generally quite healthy, actually. Um, I think it's, it's unlikely that we have a severe recession unless the Fed uh, goes way too far. And I think there is some risk of that. I think there's a real risk of the Fed overdoing um, the tightening. Um, but uh, I feel like the most likely outcome is probably either a mild recession caused by a slowdown in business investment, capex declines. Um, but it's hard for me to see how bad it can be when uh, the unemployment rate is at a record low. It is at a record low. Yeah, so, um, you know, it is really remarkable. Like I say to my students, I mean, it's just astonishing to think about the kind of job loss we had, uh, you know, in April 2020. And then, uh, you know, what we, the damage we thought that was going to uh, inflict on the economy and this, the lasting scars that might occur. Um, so let's, the role of kind of the policy response to the pandemic, let's talk about that. I mean, um, fiscal policy obviously played a, a big role. We went really big with fiscal policy. Uh, and then there's monetary policy. So curious, like, how, how would you rate uh, fiscal and monetary policy? Yeah, so at the moment, right, and, and, and I was there in the Senate, and we um, started to see what was happening when, as the economies were being shut down, it was really unprecedented, right? The, the economy fell off a cliff. Well, how could it not? It was illegal to go to work, right? I mean, we were shutting down. This is unprecedented, and the scale uh, and, the, and the fallout was, was scary. Um, so we decided to respond in a huge way. The thing that I was most involved with was the development of the, the Fed's 13-3 facilities so that the Fed would have the ability. These are facilities that enable the Fed to provide liquidity to ensure that our capital markets continue to function, all of them. And the idea was to have such a huge bazooka there that everyone would be confident because the worry was if the capital markets freeze up, then things could get really, really ugly. Like if companies can't access cash to make payroll, things like as basic as that become enormously problematic. So we created tremendous liquidity and I thought that was the right thing to do. I worked on the legislation, I worked with the, the Fed uh, leadership, got that done. Um, that I think was the right thing to do. It was becoming clear to me by late 2020 that we were putting too much money into this. So a quick way to think about this is the economy had a $2 trillion hole. We, we filled it with $6 trillion of spending. And even that last bill, I mean, the economy took a hard down. But in the third quarter of 2020, we had 30% GDP growth. It was like the most spectacular V-shaped recovery ever. And unemployment was clearly coming down fast. And we went back and spent trillions more. Now, I, I, I voted for that last bill in 2020 because, for one reason, because I was able to secure the end of those 13-3 facilities. I didn't want them to be around uh, because I thought that uh, having the Fed exercise those powers was only sensible in a time of an emergency, not in an ongoing recovery. Um, so, so I think the initial reaction was right, but it just continued, right? And then subsequent, in early 2021, it was abundantly obvious that there was no crisis anymore. The markets were functioning smoothly. Unemployment rate was dropping very, very precipitously. Economy is growing. And another bill gets through with another couple of trillion dollars. 
Meanwhile, the Fed um, had this extended period of ultra low interest rates. In my view, it is probably a very bad idea to maintain negative real interest rates during normal economic times. That has got to be distortion, right? The natural rate for interest rates has to be positive. And only significant emergencies or dire circumstances can justify the kind of extraordinary policy. One of my big criticisms of the Fed was that they continued to keep interest rates at virtually zero and to keep buying bonds, including mortgage-backed securities, at a time when asset prices were going through the roof, in part because there was so much cash being pumped into the system. Um, you know, I wasn't the only one noticing this. This was a big discussion, a big debate about the monetary policy the Fed was conducting. And many of us were concerned that the combination of negative real interest rates, massive bond buying, huge expansion in the money supply, and all of this fiscal spending that's being monetized by the Fed, how does that not lead to inflation? And the response that I kept feeling like I was getting from Fed folks was, it's okay because inflation expectations are well anchored. And I'm thinking, well, that sounds like you think Inflation is a psychological phenomenon. I think it's a monetary phenomenon. And sure enough, you know, it, it, it exploded shortly thereafter. Um, so uh, the Fed obviously discovered that they were way behind the curve. By the way, they set up a paradigm of tolerating higher than target inflation, as I'm, I'm sure you're well aware, which also exacerbated the risk that they would be late to the game of tightening. They were very late. And now we've had the most accelerated tightening um, maybe ever, certainly in a very long time. And I think the danger is that they're gonna go too far because they're making the same mistake in reverse, right? Instead of focusing on money supply and the monetary aggregates, um, they're focusing on, on trailing indicators and, and I, I worry that um, they could overdo it. Yeah, so, so it was all fascinating. And um, I'm glad you brought up the um, kind of early pandemic efforts. Um, and um, I'm about to teach a class on this on, on Monday. Some people say this is a financial crisis that didn't happen. Mm. Uh, you know, things were, we were all distracted with the pandemic in March uh, 2020. But, you know, the, the things that were going on in the financial system were just, they looked ugly. Oh, yeah. And um, kind of the, you know, it is incredible how fast those 13 three facilities uh, got set up. Um, but you're right, the kind of they pivoted later in the year, they kind of pivoted from financial stabilization, at least in their language, to kind of more traditional, the balance sheet is providing more traditional monetary support. So, yeah, you talked about um, kind of then in 2021, inflation is picking up and the Fed um, isn't kind of acting on that. Um, I guess, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, the new framework. Uh, you know, some people say it was a, a misreading of the economy, a misreading of the data. You know, other people say, you know, more it was the new uh, framework. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, taking a more expansive view of their mandate than uh, they should. So, so can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, do, do, you, can you part, do you have a view of kind of the various sources of, of various reasons they, they made these mistakes? Um, so I think the, this paradigm, this idea that 2% is not the maximum, 2% is gonna be the average inflation. I think they worry too much about inflation below 2%. I actually think that technology, it, it, th there's a natural inclination for uh, disinflation from technology. That's not necessarily a problematic thing. I know how much central bankers worry about deflation, but we, we've not been in a deflationary environment. Establishing that we're gonna have 2% as the average introduces a tremendous amount of risk. Um, for, first of all, they never were precise about, well, how far above your target do you tolerate and for how long, right? Because we've gone several years below 2%, so does that mean it's okay to go for six months at 6%? Or is it five years at 3%? Right? I mean, it, it all just dramatically introduces the risk that you're gonna be behind the curve. And, and in all my conversations, um, I think 
there's a tendency, so my perception from the outside, you have the experience of being inside, so I'd love outside. to get your sense, but yeah. it looked to me like there's groupthink, that everybody has the same sort of models and framework that they're thinking about. The monetarist school of thought seems to have been completely dismissed, and the, you know, the Milton Friedman notion that it's money that matters, and money is a commodity, and if there's too much of it, its value goes down relative to everything else, and that's what we call inflation. And that's exactly what seemed to happen to me. And I, I'm concerned. I think they were distracted with other issues to some degree. I was very critical of the Fed, especially the regional banks, getting into all kinds of social and cultural and, and non-economic issues. That's, that's not their lane. That's not their expertise. That's not what they should be focused on. Um, so I think all of those things contributed I think the Fed needs to take a, a deep dive on how they got this wrong. I think Congress should involve itself. I think we should re-examine the question of whether we should have a monetary rule. Yeah. And, and when I say rule, by the way, not that it can't have exceptions. Um, I think it can have exceptions, should be able to have exceptions. But a monetary rule gives you some predictability and I think probably stability. Interesting. Yeah, so, so I gather, you know, the Fed will say, uh, you know, we're independent, but there's a lot of accountability. Uh, you know, we're uh, testifying before Congress, we're setting, sending reports to Congress, we are speaking to the public, we're being transparent about our, ac our activities. But I gather you think um, some changes oh, yeah. might be appropriate. Yeah, no, I think they've got a lot of explaining to do. They got this very badly wrong, and it does a lot of damage when inflation gets out of hand like it did. Uh, you know, family, well, to this day, wages haven't kept up, right? The real incomes are, da are down. Even people have, wages are higher, but they're not as much higher as prices. And so there's been a huge cost. Um, and I think they've got some explaining to do. Now, I will say, it's a difficult challenge when they are confronted with the obligation to achieve stable prices and maximum employment at the same time. Um, not because those are incompatible, I think they're very compatible actually, but the problem is you, you, you can't achieve maximum employment unless you have price stability. And so I th frankly think the focus should be on price stability. That's the environment where you have the best chance of achieving maximum employment, but let that happen organically and don't, don't have the Fed trying to, trying to juggle both of those obligations. Um, I want to pivot over to longer term issues, but um, before I do that, just quickly, I mean, it's incredible that we've got you and, uh, you know, you've had these kind of important roles on the Hill uh, with regard to financial institutions and the banking system. And here we are um, about a month after a banking yeah. panic. Um, and I just quickly want to ask you, uh, you know, what you make of the panic and um, whether the panic suggests a need for a different financial regulation or a different degree of supervision? Yeah, so, so two themes here for me. First of all, I think it's really important to understand the role the Fed played in creating this dynamic, right? Um, the combination of fiscal and super loose monetary policy kind of flooded the world with dollars and guess what? Some of that ended up as a surge of deposits on the balance sheets of banks like SVB. At the same time, by keeping interest rates at virtually zero for so long, institutions sort of internalized the notion that that's what the new normal is. The Fed has decided that the normal interest rate in the United States, the overnight rate anyway, is pretty much zero. Well, that forces them out the risk curve with their assets. Now, in the case of SVB, it wasn't a credit risk curve, but it was a duration risk curve, right, of the maturity. So they took a greater maturity mismatch than was prudent, certainly in hindsight. Um, and then, when the Fed figured out its mistake and suddenly and very rapidly raised interest rates, why the corresponding decline in prices cratered the bond portfolios that the Fed was responsible for creating in the first place. So I, I really think this is where this all originates. Having said all that, I think it does also put a spotlight on a intrinsic instability we have in our banking system. 
um, that we ought to be thinking about. And what I'm referring to, is I, I think any fractional reserve banking system runs a certain level of risk. No bank can survive a run on the bank. It doesn't matter how well managed it is, no bank can survive that if it's a fractional reserve bank, right? By definition, the cash in reserve is not as great as the demand deposits, and if everybody wants their money at the same time, you're out of luck. So we've dealt with that in a way um, with deposit insurance for people who deposit up to a quarter of a million dollars. So there's no worries for anyone who has that amount or less. So there's no reason for them to run on the bank. And that's fine. At the end of the giant banks, I would argue that contrary to the technical language of Dodd-Frank, we've actually created a category that's too big to fail. It, they are perceived to be too big to fail. And so if you have large deposits, you can place them with the giant banks and not have to worry about them. Which leaves people who have uninsured deposits, which is very common at sort of medium-sized banks, they have to be asking themselves, why am I the only one in the room taking risk here? And what have we been seeing? We've been seeing a flight of deposits from these banks into the giant banks and into money market uh, funds. And, and that, that fundamental in instability, I think, we have exacerbated. We've made it worse by virtue of the guarantees of small deposits and the implied guarantee of the giant institutions. And I, I do worry about that, that instability. It, you know, it, it mattered less when interest rates were at zero because you didn't have anywhere to go to make more money. But now, you can go to Treasury money market account and make 4.5% on your money. Why keep deposits at a half a percent? So we've got to think that through. Um, there's, like I said, there's always been this in, intrinsic instability, but we've, we've made it a little worse over time, and now we've put a spotlight on this problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's just talk about a few longer term issues in terms of the economy, and, and, and I will come back. There's at least one more short term issue I want to ask you about before we go to general questions, but um, we've got a lot of longer term challenges in this economy, I think. You would agree? I mean, we've got government debt. It's nearing 100% of GDP right now. CBO projects it's going to double as a fraction of uh, GDP, roughly speaking, over the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, related to that, we've got um, you know Social Security. The financing of the system doesn't work. I think the recent projections suggest that the system will not be able to play, pay full benefits as of like 2034. Now, um, broadly in the economy, we've got productivity growth, which is okay, not as great as it was in the 1990s when you entered public service. Uh, we've got parts of the population that feel like they've been left behind because of globalization and uh, you know, perce a perception that the system is rigged. Uh, recent years have highlighted kind of the fragilities in our economy related to supply chain uh, issues. So we've got all these challenges. Yeah. There's a lot of work to be done by the policymaking community. I'm sure yeah. you're still talking to people in the policymaking community, even if you're not actively there. But I'm just curious, you know, if you could speak as a Republican about, um, you know, whether you feel like the Republican Party has um, had a harder time coming to a single kind of uh, to, to an agenda on these issues. Uh, you know, in more recent years because there's more disagreement amongst yeah. members. Yeah, uh, so let me preface it by saying I, I'm actually medium term and, and long term extremely bullish on the economy. I, I think um, America has an innovative and entrepreneurial spirit that is just an amazingly powerful engine for growth. Technology, I think, is accelerating. I don't, I, I don't know that it ever stops, but the acceleration is, is going to be really, really good for... I'd like to talk to people like you. Um, <laughs> I hang around with a lot of economists who are dark all the time. Oh, so no, I... I it's look, nice I to think, be with someone who's an optimist I mean, the, the, the government can mess things up pretty, yeah. pretty well and truly along the way, but, but we'll overcome that. And, um, no, I think the story is going to be a great one. Um, one of the biggest sort of medium-term threats, it seems to me, is the fundamental fiscal imbalance, mm -hmm. right? So we have a structural budget deficit. We routinely spend much more money than we take in, and we have a few big programs that for years have been growing faster than the economy, 
And if you think about it, right, no government program can grow faster than the economy indefinitely because it would consume the economy, right, if it does that. So that's, that's the big fiscal challenge. Um, it's, so um, there's no mystery, right? It's Social Security, it's Medicare and Medicaid, right? The programs that are on autopilot, the, they, we call them mandatory spending because Congress doesn't appropriate the money every year. Congress sets terms of qualification, and if you qualify, you get the payments or the service and uh, without any congressional intervention. Well, combined, they're something roughly like 60% of everything the government spends. And as I say, growing faster than the economy. As you point out, the arithmetic doesn't work, right? At right. some point, uh, these programs just, they just consume too much. So what do you do? Um, you need bipartisan cooperation to fix the problem. Neither party is gonna do this on its own because the other party will attack them politically. This is, let's face it, this, is, this has been considered the third rail of American politics for a reason. Well, that, um, this is why I'm, I'm very disappointed with both President Trump when he was in office and President Biden today. Both of them have adamantly refused and pretended that they own the moral high ground because they refuse to address these problems. That's intellectually dishonest and it's an abrogation of responsibility. What we need is to have folks from both sides of the aisle come together and establish uh, reforms that would be based on a few principles that would have 100% agreement. First of all, nobody who's retired or anywhere as close to retirement age is gonna have any change at all in the program. Nobody's gonna pull the rug out from under somebody that's worked their whole life planning on a certain promise being there for them, it has to be there. But that doesn't mean if you're 35 years old, you have to get the exact same program 30 years from now that we've had in place for previous decades. It doesn't add up. And if you're 35 years old, you also, by the way, have time to make changes in your life in anticipation of a reform program. So I've got ideas for how you would make changes both to Social Security and Medicare for that 35 year old and younger. And you know, we could have a, a, a discussion and, and there's lots of dials you can turn, but you can slow the rate of growth. And that's what we're talking about, right? None of these programs have to have cuts, but you have to get them to s grow at a pace that's no greater than the growth of the economy. Once you achieve that, then it's sustainable. And that's actually not that hard, like conceptually or policy-wise or intellectually. It's hard politically because the mere suggestion creates a political opportunity for your opponent to say, oh, you wanna push granny off the cliff. That, that's really irresponsible and dishonest. And I'm hoping that we have leadership to address this. I, I, I talked about reforming Social Security in 1998 when I first ran for the House. And people think that it's politically lethal to go there. I never lost the general election. And I was on record saying we need to reform these programs. The American people get it. And if you have a thoughtful, sensible program that doesn't jeopardize people who are retired or close to retirement, I think you'll actually be rewarded politically. Uh, but it's going to have to take divided government and bipartisan leadership. And some of it's going to have to come from whoever is the president when we, when we get to that point. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I show, when I teach about, you know, deficit debt challenges, like I show people, you know, a lot of this is just demographics, right? And yeah. I show people reports in the 1990s that show you know, this thing is coming. Right. You know, we saw the baby boom. Right. Um, could, could I just add one yeah. other thing, though? The, so, you know, for a while there, this uh, issue got a lot of attention, right? Remember, after 2010, yeah. for instance, um, the Tea Party movement on the Republican side was largely about economic issues, fiscal issues, lower taxes, getting our budget in, in, in order. And then we had this extended period where the interest rate environment was zero. Well, if interest rates are zero, then money costs nothing. It's free. And it's pretty hard to convince Congress to make potentially tough decisions when there's no cost to these massive deficits and this accumulated debt. I think that's changing. That's right. I, I think a normalization of interest rates 
is going to make some eye-popping numbers mm -hmm. for just for debt service, and that's going to focus. So you did ask S and silver lining to the high interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the challenge for Republicans, in my view, so that to go back to your question and the more broader on economic issues, while we've always had divisions within the Republican uh, Party and within the conservative movement and the center-right coalition on a variety of issues. In recent decades, I would argue since 1980, there's been remarkable unity around the idea of limited government, economic freedom, low taxes, light regulation, and maximum economic growth. That's been a mantra that has united Republicans. And I think there's a divide now that hasn't existed in, in, in my adult lifetime, uh, which is this populist nativist kind of movement that has gotten traction. I think it's still a minority view within the Republican Party, but it's not an insignificant minority. And it uh, seriously questions free trade and mm -hmm. market economics and their support for industrial policy and um, all kinds of regulatory and powers for the federal government that Republicans historically have not yeah. embraced. Yeah, so can, I, so can I ask, I mean, so where is this coming from? I think some people would say um, some of this is coming, you know, it's, it's political, but some of it's coming from a perception by, you know, some parts of America that they've been left behind, uh, right or wrong, by um, globalization, um, a rigged system, uh, but they feel kind of deep, like they've been deeply hurt by the so-called free market. So, I don't know, what do you make of that perception, yeah. I guess? And also, so, but, what, but what, what, you know, there is a trade-off here, which is, I mean, economists would agree, you know, incentives matter. Uh, but, you know, and there are some costs to, in terms of incentives to redistribution, but you're also, you know, protecting people. So, so yeah. Well, yeah. So, well, that kind of introduced another whole topic. I mean, so I think there are, certainly there are communities that have been left behind, right? There, there are plenty of communities. If you go back far enough, they were dependent on a single company in a single industry. And if that company can no longer survive, then that community is in a really bad spot. It might have, might have been there for 100 years. I mean, you know, I, I live in Allentown, just outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania, Bethlehem is a contiguous city and it was completely dominated by Bethlehem Steel for decades, for decades. I mean, Bethlehem Steel ran Bethlehem. It, it almost was Bethlehem. It was so big, it was such a huge economic force. Today it doesn't exist, like it's gone. Now fortunately, our region was able to diversify um, into other areas and is thriving economically, but that's not the case everywhere. So I get that. Um, Trade can be very disruptive if a trading partner can displace a domestic manufacturer. But that's no different than technology, right? I mean, think about it. if you were in the business of manufacturing typewriters when the word processor came out, how were your prospects? And we never said, well, look, let's just not have word processors because think of all the people that would lose their job in the typewriter industry, right? We've never taken that approach because a vibrant economy is disruptive as long as it's creating more opportunities than are being lost, um, you have growth. But the problem is that, that the pain is concentrated and therefore very identifiable and the benefits are dispersed, right? One of the, the features, one of the biggest benefits of free trade is that consumers have more choices and at lower costs. Um, but that's maybe a few hundred or a few thousand dollars per family and that's not as visible and as tangible as someone losing their job because the factory closed. On balance, all that extra money in all those families' budgets generates a lot of job growth, a lot more than those that are lost, but it's impossible to point to, the, not impossible, but difficult to point to the job that occurred as a result of consumers having lower costs. It's easy to point to the job that was lost because the factory can't compete with an imported product. And then, so, so, so you've got that dynamic. And then you have populists who come along and exaggerate and tell a different story. I mean, 
you know, President Trump got a lot of mileage out of saying that you know, every trade deal is done by stupid people. They're all stupid and we never should have done them. And he's completely wrong. Most of these trade agreements are actually very good for America, good for growth, good for employment. And look at right now, despite Donald Trump's best efforts, we still have pretty nearly the freest trading environment in 100 years, and the unemployment rate in America is at a record low. And there's almost two job openings for every person looking for a job. So it's, it's not the case that, uh, as it's been presented, I should say, by, by um, the opponents of, of free trade. But it's not only trade, right? The divisions extend to other areas. Well, I, I hope we'll have an opportunity to um, come back to some of these longer term issues in Q and A. You know, we haven't even touched uh, industrial policy and uh, you know whether it's a good uh, you know solution to supply chain problems. But uh, as we discussed as we were coming in, I don't want to close our conversation before talking about the debt limit. <laughs> so, uh, so as 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 people may or may not know, the debt limit is not, um, you know, it's not about, um, discussion is not about limiting the amount of spending the government is authorized, uh, you know, to do. They have, the, that spending is kind of dictated by the law. It's about whether they can, how they can fund that spending and whether they can, you know, it's a cap on their ability to borrow to fund that spending. Uh, but um, we're running up against it. I think the latest I've seen is that maybe the, the date when we exhaust our ability to uh, fund our expenditures will be in maybe as early as early June, um, probably sometime during June. And uh, you know, if we hit that debt limit, we're gonna default on something, whether it's our debt or it's uh, you know social security payments or some other you know payment that we owe, um, and that that could really wreak havoc with uh, you know uh, financial markets uh, with the dollar, uh, and that could that would be a really bad thing. So um, I guess what, what's your take on it? And yeah, if you were yeah. still in the Senate, what would you well, do? Well, well, so I've been through a lot of debt ceiling fights. So I will tell you, I think I think we should have a fight over this. Uh, this is one of the very few moments when uh, both sides have to come together and something has to get done. And so it's, it's, it's a rare opportunity. And by the way, virtually every major bipartisan budget deal going back to Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill in the 1980s happened in the context of the concentration of attention that happens on the debt ceiling. Let me dispense with, or at least address, two uh, parts of the, the common narrative that I think are completely false. One is the idea that we're gonna miss a payment on our debt, that we won't service our debt, we will be in default, and we will create an international catastrophe. I, quote me on this. I, I think we are very, very close to a 0% possibility that we will miss a payment on a treasury security. And here's a simple reason why. The ongoing revenue that the government collects in the form of taxes this year is going to be something on the order of eight times the cost of debt service. So if you've got revenue coming in, that's eight times the amount of your interest expense. Who's gonna decide not to make that payment? There's no chance that, but if you don't wanna have to reach a fiscal uh, compromise, you might wanna fan the flames of concern about this so as to weaken your opponent's bargaining position. But we should acknowledge there's not gonna be a mispayment on our debt. Now, is it possible that there'd be vendors who'd have to wait to get paid? Absolutely. So you think uh, prioritization is possible? Because that is another piece I, of the debate, right? Which I, is, I guarantee is, it's, is it possible or it's not? It's totally possible. It's and the Treasury way. has the okay. systems in place. Yeah. And they will do exactly that if they have to. They don't want to. I, I don't wanna say, I'd like to see this resolved before it gets to that point but we will not miss a payment on our debt. So what will happen? A vendor will not get paid on time. That is not ideal. I'm not an advocate for it, but it's not the same thing as missing your, your interest on your debt. And some will say, well, wait a minute, but social security payments are huge and we'll get to the point where we can't make them. And my answer to that is that's true and that will certainly concentrate the attention of Congress and there will be a deal struck before anyone it <clears throat> misses a social security check or gets a check to slate. 
So my view is this is such a huge problem for us. You, you alluded to the fact that our debt is now at 100% of GDP. This has gone very badly for other countries that have racked up this amount of debt. We're living with this luxury of being the world's reserve currency, being a place where capital uh, flees to, but we don't know how long we can get away with it and it doesn't last forever. So I think there should be some kind of uh, negotiated agreement. I think the president's position that he refuses to negotiate at all is completely unreasonable. And watch very carefully to see if the House is able to pass a debt ceiling increase with some modest fiscal uh, features attached. They are trying very hard to get the votes to do it. I think they might. And if they do, I think the features are going to look quite reasonable, like in terms of the modest curb in the growth of spending. And it's going to change the political dynamic around the discussion. It's going to make it politically implausible for President Biden to continue to take the position that he refuses to have a negotiation. Once a negotiation is engaged, I think the contours start to become clear and, and this probably gets resolved. I agree with your time frame. Um, we don't know exactly, we'll know more at the end of April. Terrific. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're right at the point where we're gonna turn things over to um, the audience to ask questions. So we've got four microphones. Uh, there's one back there, there's one up there, there's another one up there. If you could line up, that would be great. And um, let's see, what we'd like you to do is uh, state your name, state your affiliation, ask a question, one question. Uh, and uh, as we like to say, the question should end with a question mark. Uh, so, um, so great, so um, let's, let's start over there. Uh, hi, I'm Joshua. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, and my question is going kind of back to the shorter term and we were discussing the banking crisis and more broadly, there's uh, a lot of companies that have exposure and financial institutions to this interest rate risk with the Fed raising the rate so rapidly uh, and uh, at the same time, the Fed wanted to keep this expectation that rates were going to be near zero for a long time and people haven't fully adjusted to it. Uh, but unlike Silicon Valley Bank, many of these companies don't necessarily have short-term liabilities. So they're kind of a crisis maybe waiting to happen, but they're not, it's not an urgent thing. What is the role of Congress or the Fed to monitor the situation or to develop uh, solutions? How proactive should they be? And you, what do you kind of make of the argument that maybe some of these people will say, well, you wanted us to believe that interest rates were supposed to be zero, and now you're going to punish us for making that assumption? You know, what should we do with some of these tricky questions? Well, I think we need to do a deep dive on, on how the Fed handled these circumstances. By the way, I think they had to raise interest rates pretty significantly, pretty quickly. I, I'm, I'm not um, really judging whether they moved too quickly or whether a 50 basis point increment should have been 25. I, you know, they were clearly way behind the curve. And, and when in, the inflation genie comes out of the bottle, it's very hard to get, get her back in the bottle. Um, I, personally, I think the companies are gonna, should have to live with the consequences of their decisions. And yeah, they were led to believe that maybe interest rates are gonna stay very low forever, but you know, at some level they should have known that that's not sustainable. And if you have a massive surge of deposits, um, you ought to be asking yourself, you know, how much more should I be reserving against that? How much more liquid should, it, should we be? And by the way, we've got, other shoes that might drop in this economy. We've got a lot of commercial real estate that's gonna reprice, and it's gonna reprice in a higher interest rate environment. So we don't know yet how well that all plays out. Some sectors of the real estate market seem to be in really good shape. Um, others, like sort of class B office space in big cities, not so much. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of the loan to values were originally booked at relatively low rates, so, so maybe we get through that okay. But, it's really, really important that um, the consequences of mistakes are, are borne by the people who made the mistakes. I mean, I, I think there's a big risk of moral hazard if we decide we're gonna bail out everybody 
who you know got stuck on the wrong side of this trade. That's a very dangerous place to go uh, because you just encourage people to take all kinds of imprudent risks on the assumption that they too will be bailed out. So I think you gotta let the chips fall where they fall. Thank you. We're gonna go up there. Hi, Senator. Hello. My name's Robert. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the college. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my question just has to do a bit with the monetary policy we were talking about at the beginning of the discussion. Um, so as you're talking about with interest rates right now, they've been changing a bit, but previously they'd been really low for a really long time. I'm curious, do you think in such a scenario such as that, the Fed should be changing the way they conduct monetary policy in the longer term a bit? Do you think they should adopt I don't know, a price level uh, targeting approach, or do you think they should be raising uh, the inflation target to something like 4%? Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts on that when those rates are really low, the ability to fight recessions. Yeah, uh, so no, I think it'd be a very bad idea to raise the uh, uh, inflation target to 4%. I mean, you think about it, a 4% inflation rate implies, um, what is it, a halving of, of your money's value in 16 years? Am I doing the math right, Doug? Right, I mean, that, that, that for a saver, that's a disaster. Right, um, and inflation. It, one of the the real pernicious things about inflation is it's never uniform. Right, if it were completely and perfectly uniform, you could imagine that well, maybe wages would just keep up. It's four percent. It's four percent. But it's never never works that way. Some products and services go up much faster. Others are lower. Some wages are rising. Others are stagnant. Some contracts are long and don't get so. So no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't say, well, we blew this, so let's, let's uh, lower our expectations and tolerate a higher inflation rate. I do think we should ask about methodologically, how does the Fed work? Um, should there be a price target? Should there be a rule you know, a, a based, a, about what interest rates should be what, or the monetary aggregates? Should the rule be based on that? I think that's the debate we ought to be having because you know, what they've been doing hasn't worked very well. Thank you. Let's go up there. Hi, my name is Gabby. I'm a Master of Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, and my question was about your comment um, about the Republican, the House Republicans' new plan they just unveiled. I think you said a lot of the measures that were in it to curb spending were like pretty reasonable. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically about uh, like the work requirement um, proposals or provisions that are included in there. And I'm think I'm curious like why you think that, particularly for Medicaid, is more reasonable as opposed to something like cracking down on Medicare Advantage risk adjustment broad or antitrust enforcement or doing more drug reform stuff? I'm just curious, like, do you think it's all politics or your take on that? I, no, so personally, um, I think work requirements are completely reasonable. We expanded Medicaid eligibility to include young, healthy, uh, people with no dependents, we used to think of those people as workers. It's okay, I think, to expect that if you are young and healthy and have no dependents, that you're gonna be at least trying to support yourself. And at a time when there's almost two job openings for every person looking for a job, uh, I, I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation at all. So that's one of their proposals. Um, in terms of the actual spending, I think they're talking about taking the discretionary portion of the federal budget, not the mandatory, the stuff on autopilot, they are gonna intend to leave alone. But I think their intent in their legislation is that next year's spending would go all the way back to where it was last year, and then grow at 1%. These are not draconian cuts. I mean, think about how much the government spending has increased. We are spending way above our historical average. I mean. Total government spending is very nearly 25% of GDP. That's well above the historical average. Consider, I mean, some of these programs, you take the SNAP, right, the, the food stamp program. How far back do you think you have to go in American history to get to the point where that program spending half what it spent in 2022? The answer is you go back to 2019. It doubled in three years, and as I say, Jobs are plentiful, so to see, so I think a job a job requirement is a very reasonable thing. Thank you. 
We're going to go over here. Hi, my name is Randy. Uh, I'm a graduate student here. Uh, what level of concern do you have about income inequality in America? Um, you know, I, I think it's something that we've got to be somewhat concerned with. I, I don't obsess about it. I think it was exacerbated by the Fed. It sounds like I'm, I've got the Fed as my, my ready go-to to blame for everything. But actually, right, the, the first manifestation of the super easy money was inflation and asset prices. Well, who has assets? Wealthy people. So we drove up the value of these assets, real estate, stock, art, you name it. Uh, those values went up dramatically. Uh, if we had had a more stable uh, price level and we had more sensible monetary policy, we'd have had less of that. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's something we should keep an eye on, but um, the most important thing is to have strong growth and a lot of opportunity. That's my view. We're going to try to do another another round of questions. So we're going to start over there again. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Ryan. I'm a junior at the college. Uh, we were talking earlier about globalization and some of the resentment that's built in the country surrounding it, uh, and that's been complicated recently by some of the national security developments with China. Uh, it seems like there's a lot more bipartisan support for more hawkish policies to decouple ourselves from Chinese economic independence. How do you suggest? Well, one, should we do that? And two, if we should, how do you suggest we do that without, you know, undoing a lot of the benefits that globalization has bought and perhaps, you know, causing some major economic downturns? Yeah, that's a great question and it's a really important one. That, this is the big challenge that we have with China, right? The most important bilateral relationship on the planet by far is the U.S. and China. And I don't think I know we have never been through a period like this in our history. I'm not sure there's a period in world history where a great power is being challenged by a revisionist power where both economies are very, very extensively linked. That's what we have now. Uh, a decoupling has a very huge cost. There's a reason that we have extensive bilateral trade with China. It's because it's economically good for us. It's been economically good for them. Now, to the extent that they become increasingly aggressive and possibly even hostile to America and American interests, then we're going to have to revisit that. But we've got to do it with clear eyes that there's going to be a big cost and it isn't going to happen quickly. I mean, you know, companies, obviously, they, they see the politics and they see the, the, the reality and they see the danger of uh, supply chains that depend heavily on Chinese sources. And there's been migration, right? There's been migration, especially throughout Southeast Asia. But it turns out that you move your factory to Vietnam or Indonesia, well, guess where they need to get their parts from? <laughs> you know, it goes back to China. So, so this is complicated. You are absolutely right that this is the question we have to uh, address. And uh, the, the answer isn't, isn't easy and it isn't simple and it isn't static, right? It's gonna change as uh, our economies change. And um, I, I do think we're in for a really challenging time because um, President Xi, I think, is a very ambitious man. And he is determined to create a new world order in which China plays probably the dominant role, if he has his way, certainly a dominant role. And it's about making the world safe for authoritarians and dictators like him. And that's, that's not good for us. So it's, it's a really important challenge. Thank you. Hi, Senator, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Jack, I'm a sophomore at the college. I have a question about the deficit. Uh, so when you began talking about the deficit, you kind of immediately point to entitlement spending mm -hmm. and healthcare specifically. Uh, but many would say that America has experienced worse health outcomes in recent years, like life expectancy has stagnated or fallen, and it's harder to improve outcomes in health policy while simultaneously cutting spending. So what would you say to people who would suggest looking at other areas of the budget, such as defense spending, uh, which is increased significantly, and many Americans would say delivered not good outcomes, as opposed to cutting something like healthcare? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, our defense spending is much lower as a percentage of GDP than it has been historically. That's, that's just an objective fact. And if you look, I mean, we have a smaller Navy. We have a smaller Air Force. We have a smaller uh, number of men and women under arms. Um, our ability to uh, defend ourselves on two fronts is very seriously in question because we've allowed our military to contract. 
Um, so I would disagree with the characterization on defense spending. We're, we're spending much less as a percentage of GDP than we have historically. We're spending much more on healthcare as a percentage of GDP than we have historically. Um, I, out, outcomes are mixed. I'm not sure what data exactly you're referring to. There's different outcomes um, depending on the, you know, exactly what you're looking at. Obviously, COVID had an impact on uh, mortality rates and, and uh, lifespans. Um, but um, no, I, I, I don't think it would be prudent to cut back on defense spending. I think we need more defense spending right now. Um, Jay. Uh, hi, Senator. Thank you so much for making the time to speak sure. with us today. Uh, my name is Jay Rappaport. I'm an MPP student here, and I actually had the pleasure of hearing you speak last spring at the Wharton Financial Regulatory Conference. Um, what, what conference was it? The Wharton Conference? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Professor Skinner. Yep. Uh, I had a question about the recent bank crisis that we saw, um, and one topic that you've spoken about is regulatory creep, agencies you know, often going out of their lane. And I was curious about what you thought of the policy response to the bank crisis that we saw last month uh, and how you evaluated that. Essentially, did you think that agencies straight out of their lane there? Were they in the right lane but going in the wrong direction? Or were they in the right lane going in the right direction? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so. First, it's worth pointing out that this happened right under the nose of the supervisors. There's not like there was some big mysterious secret about the balance sheets of these banks. But I think it is common for supervisors to be focusing on the previous crisis. And that's, that's the lens through which they tend to look at things. And they miss the new one. And you know, this wasn't a mortgage crisis. This was a very different thing. This is partly why I think you ultimately need market forces to impose the discipline on prudential management of our banks. I think in the case of the, the SVB, I don't personally feel like I know all the facts, but I know a lot of the facts of what happened on the weekend that led to um, you know, the, the decision to guarantee all the deposits. And there's a question in my mind as to whether or not there were financial institutions that were able and willing to acquire SVB and avoid the necessity of the step that they took and whether the acquisition was uh, rebuffed for ultimately political reasons. Now, I, I, I can't prove that. It has been alleged by people who ha have um, a reasonable likelihood of, of knowing um, but that's, a, that's the kind of thing that concerns me a lot. Um, look, I think the financial regulators, there's been a pressure and there's been an advocacy um, on the part of some to have them play roles that are not appropriate for them to play. And take, for instance, um, the idea that the Fed or other financial regulators should steer capital in a way that would be, uh, would tend to accelerate a transition to a lower carbon economy, right? I mean, the regulatory powers of the banking regulators, they could easily make it prohibitively expensive to finance carbon intensive projects. They could make it less expensive to finance green energy projects. They could do that. Whatever you think of the urgency of dealing with climate issues, I hope we would agree that that's a terrible idea because nobody's elected those folks. The, the fact that they have no expertise in the area is actually the least of my concerns. The fact is, tough social, political, national decisions um, have to be made by people who are accountable to the American people or else you don't have a functioning democracy. And however imperfect it is, the representatives of the American people sit in Congress and in the White House. And we ought not to allow regulators to be making decisions that are outside of their lane. I think there has been a tendency to do that. Um, some of it, I pushed back very aggressively on that in my role uh, on the banking committee, for instance. Um, and I wonder, I, I have asked myself whether, whether that crept into decision making with SVB, but I honestly don't know the answer. Thank you. I, I'm going to take um, moderator's prerogative. We're about out of time um, and ask you the last question, which is um, I suspect um, most of the people in this room are here because they are considering at some point uh, spending some of their life in public service. And I was just wondering if you could just say 
a few words, uh, you know, about the rewards of, of public service and the, and the case for spending part of your life doing that? Um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so I spent 18 years, uh, six years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, and I don't regret it at all. It was um, some, of the, some of the most wonderful and talented people that I've ever worked with, I've worked with in government, and some people that I would not put on that list I've worked with uh, in government. Um, you know, uh, one of the things you have to, so I was a, a, an entrepreneur and I was working in the private sector. When I got to Congress, I realized I had to um, dial down my expectations about what could be accomplished. And that, that's, that's okay, that's a good thing. In our system, it should be hard to pass law because you want it to make sure it's been very thoroughly vetted in substance and both politically. Um, but it's really very, very gratifying if you feel like you're able to move the needle in the direction that you think is important. And I have had a few opportunities to do that. And I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I would, my advice for what it's worth, um, do something else first. It's really, really a good idea to have some knowledge, some firsthand experience, some expertise in the real world, in whatever field that might be. Uh, because then you, you've just got a more informed judgment about how the world works and you happen to have then a particular expertise you can bring to public service. So I, I really uh, feel strongly about that. But I would encourage people to explore it if it's something that you're inclined to. Whether it's elected office or not, public service um, has its rewards. They tend not to be financial, but they're in other forms that are really, um, really meaningful. Thank you, Senator Toomey. I want to uh, just thank you for coming and spending your time talking to us about these important issues. And I hope everyone will join me in uh, thanking the thank Senator. You. Thanks for having me. I hope you'll come again. <laughs>